Thanks for everyone um, joining us for Screenshot. Um, as always, um, we, um, the, the purpose of Screenshot is to highlight both SO members and creative veterans to maintain and having insight on how they're maintaining their creative identities through this global pandemic. Um, and it's really meant to be an intimate window into the artist's work and their creative practice from the privacy of their homes. Um, just logistically, as always, um, screenshots taking place twice a week and will always feature one SO member and one veteran um, POC creative. It's 30 minutes. Um, the artist will present examples of their work answer a series of questions, and then share some tools, skills, or best practices related to their own creative practice. And just some etiquette pointers, um, everyone on this uh, Zoom call is muted so that the future artists can present uninterrupted. If you have any questions, you can put your question in the comment section, and then I'll be asking those for you um, for Peter to answer today. Um, and then thanks to those that have submitted questions via Instagram. Um, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be introducing Peter Ashley. Peter's a New York-based photographer and director. He was born in Seoul and raised in Toronto. His work is informed by the pursuit of a contemporary standard of beauty that champions diversity and representation. Peter is also the editor-in-chief and co-founder of Burdock. Um, which is an arts and culture publication celebrating multi-dimensional Asian American experiences. His work uh, with is it within the commercial and editorial field. His clients include Vogue, The New York Times, T Magazine, H&M, and Dior. Peter is a dear friend of mine, a creative collaborator, um, an early champion of so, and he continues to support our community and we're super grateful to have him here with us today. Um, so Peter, I was thinking that you can kind of kick things off, tell us a little bit about maybe your personal background, um, where you grew up, your cultural background, and then just your path to becoming a creative. Sure. Uh, hi everyone, thanks for joining. Um, my name is Peter and as Ida mentioned, I'm a photographer and sometimes editor. Uh, and I, I was born in Korea. Uh, and when I was seven years old, my family immigrated to Toronto, Canada. And I've now been in New York for about, I'd say, 14 years or so. And my beginning was, I, I did, in Canada, I went to school for psychology and during that time, I realized that wasn't something I wanted to be doing. And I was, you know, taking photos of friends and um, things around me and decided to move to New York and go back to school for photography. So I attended the School of Visual Arts and studied photo there. Um, yeah. And then I, I work both. Yeah, I work, as Ida mentioned, I work in the commercial world uh, as well as just different personal projects, Burdock Magazine being one of them. Uh, and at the moment I'm working on uh, like a personal fine art book. So, yeah. So tell us how the, this whole pandemic has been for you. How, how are you? How does it affect your creative practice? Um, what it's taught you? Um, I think like everyone, this pandemic has been really difficult and has been super challenging. Um, but in order to stay sane, I've been trying to find different ways to stay creative and stay engaged. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, like most of my work is in fashion, but I've been slowly exploring uh, still life because I don't have access to uh, subjects. So I've been shooting pictures of like, fruit and vegetable that I've gotten from my groceries that I thought were interesting and trying to create images from that. And that's been like one way to stay creative, but also at the same time, I think my thinking was when I had spoke to my agent, she had mentioned that perhaps still life is still life photography is something that brands would still be open to uh, shooting because they could 
potentially send you the product and such. But um, at the moment, uh, I think everyone is still very nervous to do shoots. And uh, a lot of these companies don't have anyone in the office to even send the products out. So uh, we'll see. Yeah. And also because I have time, I've the reason I have this whole setup right now with the mic and headphone is because I'm going to be launching a podcast for Bardock Magazine. So uh, I'm starting the interviews this weekend. So I've been trying to learn all the ins and outs of running a podcast and just been practicing at home. So Amazing. Yeah, you look so official. <laughs> also, the best sound quality of any screenshot we've done. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Um, so I know that you have some work to share, um, with the SO members. So I was thinking maybe you can walk us through some of your work and, and walk us through your practice a little bit. Sure. Um, so I'm going to just share my screen here. All right. Can you all see that? Okay. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of my work first. Um, so I'll just screen through. Some images. So these are just various editorial work I've done. Um, and then just at the end, I've also been shooting a lot of beauty for a lot of beauty clients. So I just wanted to show some beauty work at the end as well. Um, and then you know, I just thought it'd be really helpful to walk you all through my process. Um, and I'm sure you're all familiar with mood boards. So I just wanted to talk about a very specific shoot that I recently did. It was, I was commissioned by Vogue Korea to do a cover shoot with the model Saskia. And so my first step was to put together a mood board based on, well, so the fashion editor at first sent me his mood board. And I looked over that and then pulled some of his images and kind of created my own. So these are some of the images that I really liked and what I wanted to do with her. So um, this is what I put together. And then from that, I put together, I wanted to work with the set designer and a prop stylist. So I was connected to a set, uh, the prop stylist and these are the notes I sent to him. So uh, some of it are just ideas or drawings and, and just asked him to bring a list of these props that I wanted on set. And, you know, for me, a lot of my ideas just come from my head. You know, I think a lot of people go from references to ideas, but for me, a lot of times there's ideas. And then based on that idea, I'll go try to find, specific references so I could communicate that with uh, all the people on set that I'm working with. So um, the final product. So as you see on the left, these are some references I'd sent to the set designer asking for fabrics because I really loved the feeling of like a large piece of uh, fabric that the model could interact with and fall into. So this ended up being the cover. Um, this was an idea I had uh, I don't know. I was like brainstorming about this shoot. And then I woke up one morning and I thought, oh, you know, I, I think I saw my shadow or something. And I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun if the model was kind of dancing with her shadow somehow and interacting? So I asked, I sent this drawing to the set designer and said, can you make me a cutout of like a body that she could um, work with? And so that's what they did. We went to the rooftop of the studio and I had her stand on the feet and kind of dance with it. And ultimately, this was the image that I selected that I really liked. Um, I had this idea that I wanted to stick her to a wall with a bunch of tape. So I that in the corner, you see the multicolor masking tape. So I had asked the model to, I mean, I asked the set designer to bring different masking tape of different colors. So that's what he did. And that's the final image on the right. And then on the left, you see where the hairstylist actually had an idea and was like, hey, you know, I, I could actually use that tape and make a hair piece. And so that's what she did. And that was one of the images that came out of that. 
Um, so the ma the editor had sent me that image of an art piece that he had seen at a gallery with the pink flooring. And I had said to him, oh, you know, and he's like, oh, I really like this type of image. And I said, oh, why don't we replicate something similar, but do our own take on it. So I had said to the set designer, can you bring bamboo instead? And, you know, and then he created this set for us. And, um, and then while we were shooting this, the hairstylist also like spiked up Saskia's hair to kind of mimic the leaves. And then she herself created this hand gesture, which I thought was really fun to kind of also mimic the shape of the bamboo. Uh, this was a reference I really liked. And, and then we kind of, everyone kind of collaborated on set. So the set designer took masking tape and outlined like a circle on the ground on some foam. Cause I'd asked them for some interesting flooring texture. And I really liked this, like, I, I don't know what that board is called, but the one that you put pins on, on the wall. Um, so that's it. That's, so that was that shoot. Um, and then I wanted to talk about the magazine Burdock that I started with my sister. Um, as Ida mentioned, uh, our, we wanted to create, we wanted to increase representation of Asian American in media. And, you know, I never grew up with a magazine that had images of people that look like me. So um, we thought we would create a print publication that highlighted, and also just, I don't know. I, I guess I just didn't know when I wanted to pursue photography, I didn't know that that was a career path I could take because I didn't know of any other Asian American photographers. So I think we wanted to create something where we could show uh, young Asian creatives that, you know, these are different career paths and it's something that you can pursue and here are the people that are doing that. Um, but I wanted to show some layout explorations just as kind of a, I, I think it's kind of related just in the sense that these are layouts that our graphic designers put together for each layout. And, you know, as you could see, there's so many different steps that we go through or different like explorations. And then from there, I will pick one and have a discussion with the team and decide what we want to go with. But I think this is almost similar to like when you're editing your own photos um, you know, there's so many different options you could take and different things. I think for me, for the longest time, editing my own photos was one of the hardest parts of uh, photography. And I think later on, the one trick that helped me was to pretend that I was editing someone else's images. Or, and I also gave, like, I would just leave it for like a week or two. So then I had more space to come back to it. And so there's a little bit more detachment and some space there. And then even when I make the edits, I focus on rather than the image itself, but the feeling and kind of the emotional um, kind of reaction that I got when I looked at it. And I think when I'm editing through layouts as well, I, I think it's a similar process where um, I look at all the different uh, layouts and go, okay, what's, what, what am I reacting to emotionally? What, what what do I get excited about? Or even, um, you know, I think when you go through something like Instagram and you see other people's work, uh, the most, uh, I know when an image is compelling, when I look at it and go, oh, I wish I took that photo. And so in the same way with my work, like after I've done a shoot, um, even with like the Saskia one, there's, you know, there were so many options, even with this uh, shadow one, but at, you know, I would lay, I would first edit, do a rough edit of like my favorite images and then I'd just leave it for like a week and then I'd come back and then see what I react to. And for some reason, like this body gesture and the way the arms kind of bent on the shadow was really interesting to me. So, and I had a reaction. So, um, yeah, that was, that was a process, but that's kind of, that's it really of what I wanted to show you all. Awesome. I love seeing how you're able to communicate your concepts and your ideas in these really tactile ways. Like you did that actual sketch and illustration, I'm assuming. Yeah, I'm a terrible drawer, but I could, you know, I could draw 
I, I draw these little sketches to help communicate to the rest of the team. And as we were just saying before, I think often the purpose of the mood board for me personally is, and the mood board and all these references are to share with the rest of the people on set because you're working with a lot of people. And even if you have an idea in your head, you need to be able to communicate to the rest of the team. So they're on the same page. Um, and, you know, like that image with the bamboo, it, it was a collaboration. Everyone had to come together and go, oh, well, for the hair, we should do this because that'd be interesting for the shape. And even the makeup artist would say, well, I don't want to take away from this or that. Or, you know, I wish I had it to show you, but when I got on set, I, I had printed out all these references and all my drawings and such. And we also printed out all the different looks that the stylist had pulled. And so what I did on set was I took, while the hair and makeup was being done, I took paper and like scissors and cut it all up. And I, based on the looks and the colors, I kind of said, well, I think this look would really look great for um, this, this idea I had, or uh, let me, just share that um, keynote again. So for, you could all see this right now? Okay, so for this image on the right with the tape, because the color, color of the tape was significant, I just thought we had to have a very clean um, like outfit. So when I saw from the stylist rack, there was this white coat. I was like, oh, that's perfect. Uh, let's, use, let's save that for when we do the taping to the wall. And then the makeup artist was also like, oh, you know what, to highlight the color, let's give her a really bright red lip. So I think it's a collaboration and I think the images and references are helpful to, uh, to just all be on the same page and create the best image you can as possible. Um, for we'll all start taking questions. So uh, ask your questions in the chat section. Madi had said um, that portfolio is fire. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, so Darren's asking, um, what do you feel like you took out of your time at SVA? Um, also, Edie, your earrings are fire. Thank you. My sister made these. So yeah, what did you take out of your time at SVA? I think when I think back to my time there, the most valuable thing that I received there was the critique time. So what, what that is, is every year we had one class, which is critique, photo critique, and you would create work weekly and you'd bring it and you'd hang it on the wall and all the students would gather and talk about what they saw and what they liked and what they didn't like. And it was kind of an open forum to kind of get an understanding of what people responded to and what people found interesting or what people didn't like. And although you couldn't satisfy everyone, I think it was just an experience that you don't get once you're out in the real world because, you know, it's hard to even get honest criticism, I think, when you're on your own because obviously your friends and family are going to like everything that you do. And I don't know. I, I just thought it was super valuable. And it's, and it was even little things where like one example I could think of is uh, I started off my career doing portraiture and I kept cutting off people's fingers at the bottom of the frame. So I would take like a portrait, but then, I wouldn't get the whole hand at the bottom and it kept cutting off the finger and a couple people pointed out they're like hey like you got to be mindful of where you make your crop because that's really awkward how you cut off the fingers and i was like oh you're right like i never even thought about that and i never even noticed so it's little details but i'm also like very pragmatic and i'm i i like very critical um like i like criticism and i like things that are more specific so then i could actually work on it um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I think that was kind of the biggest, uh, the thing I liked the most of being in a school with other s students. And the other thing I really liked was that SVA, even though I wanted to pursue like commercial photography and fashion at the time, um, they were really, 
we had to take a lot of art history classes. And mm. to me, uh, photo history was really helpful to help me think outside of what I think a fashion photography, a, a fashion image is supposed to look like. So um, it just opened up all sorts of fine art photographers that I'd never heard of. And those references and those ideas, I think, were very helpful. Nice. So uh, Layla, um, who's a photographer, um, asked, how do you go about choosing creators and models for Burdock? Um, so we've only, we've only put out one issue so far, and each issue is thematic. So the first issue was on the theme of celebration. So we photographed, um, we interviewed people like Philip Lim and Danny Bowen of Mission Chinese Restaurant. And I don't know, I, I think it's quite organic on how we do it. And, uh, you know, my sister and I, like some of the stories were pitched to us, some of them we thought of ourselves and we reached out to the different um, creatives and asked them if they wanted to be a part of it. So I don't know that I have a specific uh, rhyme or reason. I think it's just when we both have, for that issue, it was like, it was a celebration issue and we thought who are some creatives that we really, really uh, respect and are excited by, like who should we interview in this? So that's kind of how we came up with the people that were in that first issue. Nice. Uh, Mitzen, who is a writer and a photographer as well, says, um, what's next for Burdock Media and how do you source contributors? So kind of similar, but what's next for Burdock? Yeah, so we started working on the second issue, which was a sound issue. And we've gotten through maybe about two thirds or three fourths of it done. And then we were kind of shut down by the pandemic because a lot of the shoots that we had scheduled couldn't happen anymore. Um, so that's kind of where we are with that issue. But um, as I mentioned, I'm launching a podcast, hopefully, and that'll hopefully go live in the next two weeks or so. But um, we're starting interviews this weekend. Uh, and then eventually, I think we do want to build up our online platform a little bit more. So we could, because the print magazine only comes out once a year, um, I would love the website to be a space where we could post more articles and have more contributors and share different stories. So I think um, once we have the bandwidth and once we have things updated to be, uh, then I would love to have more stories up there as well that are more current. Nice. I can't wait for that. Um, okay. So Jordan wants to know which artists, um, are your inspirations? Um, so I guess as far as photographers, um, as I mentioned, my kind of start into photography. When I was at SVA, I was shooting mostly portraiture and that's kind of how I started my career. And so at the time I was looking at um, a lot of portrait photographers. So there's a photographer named Hiro Kikai, K-I-K-A-I, whose work I really enjoyed, um, who went to this like, temple in Japan temple wall for like 30 years and just documented people walking by and took these amazing portraits of them and would write a little note like man just man going to a job interview but um what's really interesting is that you look at these photos from like the 70s and 80s and some of it looks so contemporary and you have no idea at what time period they're taken and um that was really amazing. Um, I also like Alex Soth, S-O-T-H. Uh, I think his work's really interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know. Those are those are a couple photographers whose work I really like. Those um, Google that, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ray wants to know who is a person you really want to work with. Uh. In what sense, like a, a client or do I want to photograph or? Photograph. What's that? Um, like someone that you want to photograph. 
Someone that I want to photograph? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't really have anyone at the top of my head, to be honest. Um, but I, I have been wanting to... So I, I've been starting to direct videos more. So I did like a, a couple commercials and little like beauty videos, but I would love to direct a hip hop video. I think that would be really fun. So I don't, that doesn't really answer your question, but <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be like an interesting, like some, like a project that I think would feel, uh, like learning it because even with film and video, it's been really interesting just learning a complete different medium because with photography, you know, you just have to, it's like a split second. And with one image, you have to keep someone interested, but to keep someone interested for like five minutes throughout a whole music video, I think um, would be really fun and interesting and difficult to do. Nice. Um, so Dash wants to know, do you ever incorporate some of the things that you learned in psych into your work now? I think so. I think, well, I think because I'm working with people, um, I'm assuming some of this, I don't know. I, I'm not sure, <laughs> but I, I guess I'll say this. It's like at the end of the day, like, in, if you want to be a commercial photographer, you have to work with a lot of people and a lot of different people. So I think, um, I think your social interactions and just is as important as your actual work itself, because you're going to be on set with 15 people. Or um, if you're on doing an advertising job, there's even more people and clients and et cetera. So I think my advice would just to be kind to people and yeah just be pleasant to work with yeah i think that's great because you want to bring that kind of energy to the set because you spend all day with the folks that you're working with exactly because i i don't no one like at the end of the day like it doesn't matter how great your work is like if you're an asshole i don't want to spend like <laughs> <laughs> eight hours with you yeah. you know or sometimes 12 so yeah so jorge wants to know do you think print will ever die i don't <laughs> think so no um only because i think i think we all love tactile experiences we love touching things and we also love collecting things and that's never going to change so i think as useful digital is i think at the end of the day people still want to buy things and collect things and interact with it so i think print is another one of those precious um experiences um because you're gonna want to you, you know i think we're always gonna want art and we're always gonna want to hang a poster on the wall and we all want to flip through a magazine i think that experience goes beyond just you know print versus digital so I don't think so yeah that's awesome kind of on a like a, a related note so Mo wants to know do you see the industry and the business of photography changing post COVID and then what can we aspiring artists do at this time to continue to build our craft while not being able to shoot yeah that's um I do think things are going to change I mean I've been having a lot of conversations with other friends who are in the industry and yeah i mean if i'm completely honest it's quite it's a little bit scary because we have no idea when the next time it'll be safe for 10 to 15 people to be in a room together and what that looks like and i've spoken with producers who produce shoots and they've said you know they are trying to figure out how to maybe even have someone on set who sanitizes everything, who, um, you know, make sure everyone is social distancing. Or I've been getting emails from certain studios saying that they're preparing to, when they open, that things are going to be sanitized or they're not going to have people at the studio except for one person to oversee that everything's going okay. So yeah, things are going to change and I, I don't know. And I, 
and also the other thing that's quite scary is that during this time, a lot of the small businesses are going out of business. And, you know, aside from the handful of major fashion brands, most companies are independent small businesses and designers and people that we're shooting um, campaigns for. And I think, yeah, I think work will definitely change. And I, I, I don't know, it is like, it's kind of scary. And I, I have no idea. But um, what can what can we do to build our craft? I think, I don't know. I, I've been trying to figure that out on my own, to be honest. I think um, I spend my days watching a lot of YouTube videos <laughs> on DIYs. I've been teaching myself new skills. Um, I've been doing uh, Spanish audio lessons. Um, I think at the end of the day, and I've been like learning how to like plant herbs and stuff. I, I think just, I don't think it necessarily, I think the whole creative process goes beyond just doing the exact uh, craft that you do. Like beyond, like when I think about ideas that I come up with for shoots, it's, it often comes from sources that are outside of photography. Um, you know, I don't, I don't really... I used to do a lot. I used to spend a lot of time looking through fashion magazines and looking at other shoots and going through Instagram and such. But I think now I find less ideas and inspiration from that, but rather just from unrelated random things, just uh, interacting with nature or even like seeing a flower and going, Oh wow, that color combination is really amazing. Or that shape is really interesting or the way the branches come out. That's a cool angle. So I think, um, I think it's just also, yeah, I think it's just spending your time interacting with um, nature, I think is always, to me, one of my greatest inspirations. And um, I don't know. That's a really good question because I'm also struggling with that as well too. Yeah. But I think it's all about just honing your taste. And, mm. you know, I tell people the hardest thing about photography and like having your own aesthetic and point of view is like having a very specific taste right and I think part of that is practicing knowing what you like and what you don't like or what you find compelling and what you don't and so even and that comes to everything even if it's like listening to music or um looking at you know reading a book or something just having a sense of like I like this and this is interesting to me because X, Y, and Z, and I don't like this, like constantly developing such a strong emotional response to things and constantly like practicing a sense of like aesthetic and your, what makes you unique and what, what do you, what excites you and what upsets you, you know, for me, it's even like, um, yeah, some flowers like, I was walking and I've just learned about gladiolus. I think that's what they're called. These like purple flowers, but they kind of gross me out because it like, I don't, I don't like the way they fall and the shapes are too strong or the colors and uh, just weird things like that, I think are interesting because yeah. I just think it's, you have to be so particular and, uh, and I think that's like a good practice that's going to come in handy when it comes to not just photography, but just being creative to be able to make those decisions, even on set to go, if you know someone says do you want to use this hat or this hat or do you want do you want earrings or no earrings you have to be able to look at it and make that instinctive decision and say no that you know i'd rather keep it clean or like you know that's too much for me so mm -hmm. um, yeah i think that's great in terms of like honing in on your values and i even like what you said like what the stuff that excites you but what upsets you as well so julissa wants to know Right. really loud <laughs> um Jaleesa wants to know is there any media books movies arts that have had a big impact on your practice um yeah I mean I think when I was starting out I was looking at I was obsessed with printed matter and, and magazines in particular because I always thought I wanted to shoot for magazines so I obsessively 
um, would spend my days at Barnes and Noble, just flipping through every magazine that was there. And I think that was also the beginning of how I started going, well, I like, I want to shoot for this magazine because I really like the images in here. Um, and I think in my earlier days, I was really drawn to ID magazine and dazed and a lot of the stuff coming out of London, of the independent magazines, just because to me it felt very experimental and it felt like it broke all the rules of what I thought a fashion image was supposed to look like. Um, because I think the mainstream media kind of feeds you fashion as like big hair, big makeup, you know, kind of, uh, it's this like big glamorous thing, which it could be, but I, I don't think it necessarily has to be. Um, so I think those magazines were quite, uh, influential when I was getting started, but, you know, I was also looking at like Vogue and GQ and all the mainstream publications as well. But, um, I would say like most of, yeah, I would say like magazines were kind of the catalyst of, um, start kicking off my interest in fashion mm -hmm. photography and imagery. Um, but I, I do also enjoy looking at independent like photo books and stuff um just because yeah. yeah i find like i you know you get a lot of ideas like just seeing uh images and going oh i never thought to crop an image like that that's quite like unusual but kind of interesting and you kind of make mental notes of that yeah, yeah i love that that was some of your earlier references and now you're like shooting days covers and i think that's yeah. just exciting to hear <laughs> like how you were able to look at some of the things that you're excited about and now have gotten to the point where you can be a contributor. So Chris, who's a filmmaker and a photographer, um, asks, has the business of photography taken away your passion of shooting at any point in your career? And how did you overcome that? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think it definitely did at the beginning because, I, yeah, because I, I think when you're starting out, you're not, necessarily working in ideal situations because I remember the earliest shoots I was doing you're kind of you know I would do these test shoots where I would like run to H&M and put a bunch of clothes on my uh, credit card and then go meet up with my friend and we try to do a test shoot and then you'd get like a new face model so it that struggle is like it does take its toll on you because in a way like you're waiting for someone to give you a chance but then and you're thinking oh well if i had access to this top model and this hair makeup and this and that then obviously i can make a great image but and that was really frustrating and really like like you need to make you need to make something great to get that first chance but then you need that first and so it that's that kind of um yeah there was definitely the feeling of being stuck um but i think in retrospect when i think back and w from what i know now i realize all of that doesn't really matter as much it's just about making an interesting image and i think once you kind of get out of this idea that fashion is a fashion image is an image of like a top model in like some designer clothes, you know, um, I think then it kind of frees you to kind of make images for the sake of making a beautiful image. And I think sometimes that is a lot more interesting as an image than like when I was trying to like make a quote unquote fashion image. And I think um, one of the references I think everyone should look at is an artist called Vivian Sassen, S-A-S-S-E-N. And her work is really amazing. And she did a couple books uh, where she just went with her friend, who just photographed her friend. And she'd wrap her in like random pieces of fabric or plastics and stuff. And they're really beautiful. And now she shoots for the biggest fashion magazines and brands. And I don't think her intention was to be a fashion photographer. It just led that way because her images are so beautiful and it just let, it lends itself to selling clothes if you put really nice clothes on it. But it's an, it's an example of someone who created images that were amazing with nothing. And I think more and more I'm realizing that's kind of the 
best path to get into photography. And, you know, maybe I would have done things differently if I had known that Hmm. at the earlier stages of my career. Yeah. I think this time is really pushing people to think really creatively. I think that's really great advice. Um, Dash wants to know, this is a big one, any accomplishments or milestones you're looking to hit before 2020 ends? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I don't know. I would love to get back to shooting again. I mean, that would be the big milestone. Um, And I also uh, worked on a personal project right before everything shut down in November. I went to uh, Korea to do a project. And, you know, I'm going to start editing through those images. Um, I had spent a bunch of time earlier this year going into the darkroom to make some of those prints. But I had, you know, my plan was to like have a gallery show and release like an art book and such. But now with the pandemic, I think things are, I don't know, I have to be more flexible and trying to figure out the best way to, um, yeah, go about releasing it without the access to like a physical gallery that people could go to. So yeah, we'll see. I don't know. (laughs) We're excited. (laughs) So Aaron, who is also a really um, amazing um, Asian American photographer, um, asked, has COVID-19 changed your perspective on what matters in regards to the work that you're making? And he's kind of gone on to say how um, he's not feeling as inspired at looking at fashion images and um, it's kind of lost a little bit of its value. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think, um, I was saying to Ida earlier that just, I haven't been going on Instagram as much for that exact reason, because for some reason, I don't know. I, it, first of all, images aren't really being made as much anymore, obviously. And I guess to your point that sometimes, uh especially right now just looking at a fashion image like quote unquote fashion image sometimes feels a little bit frivolous or um unnecessary in a way but at the same time i think um i think photography and imagery and art definitely has a place because it still is a form of communication and i think you know we all right now need positivity in our lives so if uh if a song or an image could kind of inspire you or excite you or give you ideas then i think that's a positive thing whether that's a fashion image or a non-fashion image so um yeah i think and i think sometimes maybe just for fashion images, sometimes I think going backwards and not looking at current stuff mm. is, is interesting to me because, um, yeah, because, you know, going back and looking at just older images, I think sometimes uh, feels somehow more modern and contemporary than the newer stuff. So, yeah, I think that's great, especially because there's not a lot of new stuff that's coming out right now is to kind of look back, which I always think is a great kind of creative process. So our last question is, um, when you feel stuck or lost, where do you look for motivation or where do you find motivation, or see motivation? Um, when I feel stuck, where do I see motivation? I don't know. I That's a good question. I think... Um, Before the pandemic hit, I think I was so busy that I didn't have time to think about that. You just had to create because uh, if the next day I had a shoot and I didn't have any ideas for it, like I would just have to go and improvise. And a lot of times like that is my process. You know, even though I showed that example of the mood board and all those drawings and stuff, I don't necessarily do that for all the shoots. I think it kind of depends on the context, who the client is and what it is I'm trying to accomplish. Or sometimes I I just kind of um, improvise on set. And sometimes that results in kind of the best uh, results. So where you kind of react you know you're kind of creating but reacting to what's there so 
um, you know, if the stylist, if you're working with a stylist who's, uh, who's very involved and wants to create kind of interesting clothing pieces, then the clothes almost become part of the, the bigger story. So then you react to that and figure out how to crop it and frame it and kind of create something interesting from that. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. I, where do I see motivation? I, to be honest, like I keep coming back to it for, but for me, like I find the most motivation from nature. Like I, I just need to like, you know, take, go, go to the botanical garden and like yeah. kind of leave fashion behind and not think about it or even just like, you know, even during this pandemic, I think there's all this pressure to like kind of be super productive and like get all this work done. But it, unfortunately, like I, that's not, I don't think it's as easy as it sounds because you're almost paralyzed because you have too much time and you're also worried like, mm. you know, I'm, I'm stressed out because I, I'm not working. Um, and so you're still trying to be productive. So other times I just kind of have to like, give myself a break and be like, you know what? Like this is stressful for everyone. There's a lot of stress and anxiety. And so I'm just going to like go play video games for a couple hours. And like, <laughs> that's okay. And in a way, like, I don't like, sometimes I'm like, I don't, I don't want to think about photography right now because, and in doing something else, like you kind of give yourself a break so you could kind of come back fresh. And, um, so I would just say like, yeah, like, don't, don't be like, yeah, don't put so much pressure on yourself right now to mm. be super creative. But I also think like, you know, create opportunities for yourself where creativity could come naturally. And, 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 but at the same time, I, I do think like, um, there is a certain amount of initiative you do have to take and put yourself in that situation. Because like I said, with the, like the vegetable photos I've been taking, I was just like, I gotta, I gotta do something. So then I like, bought weird looking vegetables and just like spent a couple hours sitting there and like you know um the other day I did my like grocery run to a Korean supermarket and like you know I found this like really long kind of weird crooked like Korean green chili pepper and I was like oh that kind of looks like a nose um, and I was like, oh, I'm going to like tape that to my wall and like make a face out of like vegetables. So I like that's still on my list to do. And I plan to do that either today or tomorrow. But it's just little things like that. Um, I don't know. I think you could surprise yourself and like find images that are really interesting. And I think in doing still life photography, I've also been like looking at a lot of um photographers who work in uh still life as well and uh you know some of it is really interesting like there's one photographer let me let me see if i got his name right oh his name is uh jack davison d-a-v-i-s-o-n um and i i think his work is really interesting and compelling and um you know even if you go on his instagram just some of the like I think his like cropping and stuff is so um, sometimes unconventional. And I think to me, that's really interesting. And he'll make crops that I would have never thought to do, or he's shooting pictures of like, just like his dog and like random things. But like, for some reason, it's interesting because it feels fresh and new and different. So um yeah, I think what it's, you you have emphasized is like one, like replenish your creative juices, but like to find them and be creative during this time. And I think that's just like such great insight. I think for any creative right now is to just be kind to yourself, be gentle, but also replenish where you can and and turn to things that you wouldn't usually once you're like you know functioning on hundred percent. So I think your yeah. has been really great and exactly I can't wait to see more of your vegetable pictures. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Maybe that'll end up being your big milestone for exactly. It's a the, full art book. <laughs> yeah, and the last thing I'll say is like I I think I think you gotta like spend this time to like do all the things that when you were busy you wish you had time to do because I I already know right now that once this is over, I'm going to look back and go, oh, I had all that time. I should have like done all this um, tedious shit that I've like not had time for. And I had it then. So I, I just think 
Um, you know, I was saying to you earlier that one of the things I've been wanting to do is organize all my negatives and put them into sleeves. And that's just been stuff that I've never had time to do, but now I do. So I should just get it done. So yeah. So pro tip <laughs> organization is key. Well, we really appreciate you taking out the time, Peter. I and mean, I just appreciate your honesty too, and sharing your insight and your work. Um, it's just, it's always great to have you um, and chat with you and hang out because you're one of the friends that I miss a lot. Yeah, so I know. <laughs> Well, thanks again for having me. And course, I, yeah. I hope this is helpful. Yeah. So everyone, I put the, uh, Geneva put the survey. Um, she also had put some of the references that Peter had mentioned in the chat. So when you can, please um, fill out the survey so we let, um, to let us know what you thought. And um, thank you so much, Peter. Yeah, hope thank you. See you soon. See you soon. IRL, I'll give you a hug. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for hanging out. Um, again, anyone interested in submitting for the coloring book, um, it's due um, this Sunday. So please let us know if you're going to do that or not. Got a thumbs up from Darren. Cool. <laughs> okay, so we'll see and talk to you all soon. Thank you, Peter. Okay, thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.